do my whole introduction? Yeah. Okay. You okay for that? I think so. <coughs> Hi, my name is Deb Weisbein, and I'm here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. It is Thursday, March 1st, 2001 at 2 p.m., and I'm going to be conducting an interview of Honorary Fellow Eli Rosenbaum. And I almost stayed in Philly because I, I've lived in uh, Boston, New York, Philly, and Washington, and of all the places I've lived, this is the best. Really? Oh, it's just a great city. Yeah, I'm a little sad to go to New York, but I kind of feel like I should do it now. You know, maybe I'll come back to Everyone later, should try it. Everyone yeah. should try it. And it's not far away, especially now with the Metro Center oh, doing so it in fast. hour 15. I know. And now that I get to work for a big firm, hopefully they'll mm. pay for my train yes, ticket. they will. <laughs> that's the one thing about the DA's office that's, you know, lacking. There's no perks there. Well, the same is true of the Justice I Department. I believe it. Good afternoon, Mr. Rosenbaum. Good afternoon. Thank Good you so much for taking friend. the time to do this interview. Great pleasure. Okay, let's begin. Um, when and where were you born? I was born in New York City, in Manhattan, in uh, May of 1955. And did you grow up in the city? I grew up actually on Long Island in central Nassau County in a little town uh, called Westbury. And how many siblings do you have? I have two younger brothers. And what did your parents do? Uh, my mom was a homemaker and uh, took care of us. That was more than a handful. And uh, my dad um, worked uh, for his father in a, a, a company that uh, originally uh, uh, had some small uh, uh, five and ten cent stores and then later um, uh, much larger department stores. And it became a fairly big company, public company, very successful for many years. And your father was a U.S. Army psychological warfare specialist. Yep, my dad was uh, a non-commissioned officer in the United States 7th Army's Psychological Warfare Branch. And he served during World War II? He did indeed in uh, North Africa and uh, Europe, and uh, including the occupation of Germany. And how, if at all, did that affect your childhood? Um, my dad um, would occasionally, or could occasionally, be drawn into telling war stories. And like uh, most people who've served in the military, including people who've served in uh, wartime, however awful many of their experiences were, uh, they also had a lot of very uh, entertaining stories and even funny stories. And so my father, for instance, would tell uh, about the time when they needed someone in his unit to box against somebody from another unit, and somehow my dad got cajoled into boxing. He'd never boxed in his life, and apparently was seriously good at it as, as, as someone with no experience. Um, uh, he tended not to tell the, the, the scary stories to, to, to me as his oldest child who was most interested in, in these things. Uh, the closest he ever came was explaining that one of their responsibilities was to string speaker wire uh, across the front line and put up speakers so they could broadcast messages, so to speak, or announce messages to the German side urging them to surrender. I had thought, until he told me that story, that the psych warfare uh, was a comparatively safe uh, a unit to be in, but no, 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 not when you're running speaker wire across the front line. Um, the other story that uh, he told me, which I think really did influence my, uh, my career, uh, he told me one day when we were driving, with just the two of us on the New York State uh, Thruway in a blizzard, and there was really nothing else to do but talk. And we got into uh, war stories, and somehow, I, I don't recall how, it came out that he had been uh, dispatched by his commanding officer to uh, go to the Dachau concentration camp uh, a day or so after its liberation, because word had spread very quickly in the region that some terrible thing had been encountered by U.S. forces there. And they sent my dad and another fellow to uh, uh, check it out and report back on what, what, it, what was there. I should add that uh, only last year, we, or, year, or two years ago, we found in my, or my dad found in his uh, small box of things that he saved from the war, the actual order sending him and, and another uh, individual to the Dachau camp to report on what was there. And I, of course, said, well, Dad, you know, what was there? What did you see? And his uh, mouth opened as though he were to speak and uh, no sound came out. And then I noticed that his eyes were welling with tears. And um, it's hard to talk about it now. Um, and he didn't say anything. And to this day, he hasn't told me. But he doesn't need to tell me, because that really said what needed to be said. 
But that, you know, as a young, um, young person, I couldn't have been much more than 12. Um, seeing your father cry is um, a profound experience. Um, and it, it was the beginning of an understanding for me of how awful the Holocaust was. And so where did you go to high school when you were growing up? I went to William Tresper Clark Junior Senior High School in uh, Westbury East Meadow, Long Island Public School. And were you involved in any activities there that led you down a legal career path? No, no. Uh, I, I did the usual things that uh, liberal students did in the, in the early, late 60s, early 70s. I belonged to the Human Rights Club and uh, the Model Congress, that kind of thing. But I, I don't think, uh, I, I did not have law in mind then at all. And was your family religious? Um, they were moderately, um, what's the word, not observant. Oh boy. We were affiliated. I mean, we went to, uh, we were Jewish, uh, are Jewish. We went to services on uh, the high holidays. Uh, and, and that was, you know, about it. Mostly the high holidays, occasionally a little more. But we took it seriously. Um, but we, um, we were not, uh, you know, weekly. I did. When I was a little boy, I used to go every Saturday for a couple of years. And I liked it. I liked it. Um, I should add that um, uh, both of my parents are from Germany. Uh, both of them escaped uh, Germany uh, just before the war. Uh, and that, I am sure, had some impact on my, uh, my interest in this field. Neither of my parents spoke about the war, about, about the Holocaust much. It was, and I think it was their silence about it that uh, made me more interested. You know, that which is taboo is much more interesting to children. And although I was not a big uh, reader of uh, Holocaust literature, I read some. Uh, and I saw uh, one thing on television that had shocked me as a child, a, a reenactment of a war crimes trial that I think was on CBS. Uh, and it was something that I thought about. And did they talk at all about their experience in Germany other than the war? Very little, very little. Um, I, I remember my father talking about uh, attending an assembly in school uh, at which they had to listen to a, a Nazi anthropologist expound on the inferiority of Jews. And this was at a time when Jews were still allowed to go to school, public school. And he was, um, uh, he decided to prove this by picking um, a, sort of a, a model Aryan from the student body to come up on stage and a Jew. So first he picks his model Aryan who turned out to be my blonde blue eyed father, whom all the students knew was Jewish. And of course, they erupted in laughter. Um, the one story my mom told that, that I recall, and they must have both had very frightening experiences, but they didn't talk about it. The one I remember from my mom was um, that uh, she and her best friend were the only Jewish kids in their school until Jews weren't allowed to go to public school. Uh, and there was a uh, Christian prayer every morning. And when that happened, she and her friend were ushered out of the classroom so that the other children could pray. And she said she felt really bad, um, as, th as though there was something wrong with their religion because they were excluded from this. And that has definitely informed my view on prayer in public school, and it's, it's one reason why I'm so opposed to it. Did your parents meet in Germany? No, I met here, in New York. So what brought you to Philadelphia and to Penn? Well, I um, uh, applied uh, in high school to college, and uh, among the schools I got into were Cornell and Penn. And uh, my uh, mom dutifully took me to Ithaca to see Cornell on a beautiful sunny day. And my dad, uh, and it's a gorgeous campus, meaning no disrespect to any other school. Um, and um, my uh, dad uh, kindly took me to Philadelphia on a cold, rainy winter day when the students were on strike against, I think, the war in Vietnam. So there was really nobody to see me. The place looked awful. Uh, it was a city. And I thought, no, no, no. I'm going to Ithaca. 
So I went to Ithaca and hated every minute of it. Uh, Cornell has a beautiful campus from the day you arrive in early September until about October 1, when the leaves fall off the trees and the snow begins. And then it's a hideous campus until the spring. Uh, and I didn't like the school at all, so I uh, applied to transfer to Penn, to Wharton, and that was one of the, uh, the best decisions I ever made. Uh, so starting in my sophomore year, I came to Penn and uh, fell in love with uh, the school, uh, with, the, uh, with the teachers, with the students, with the city of Philadelphia, and hung around also to get my MBA at Wharton. And uh, in many respects, those are the best years of my life. So at the end of this interview, I'm staying, I'm not leaving. <laughs> what, um, what led you to go to Wharton and to take a degree in finance and get your MBA? Well, I had thought that, uh, like my father went to work for his father, I was going to go to work for my dad. And that's what I usually did in the summers. Uh, so, of course, uh, a degree in finance would be very useful. In fact, when I went to uh, Cornell, I was in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Uh, again, thinking that uh, that kind of training would be useful. What Cornell told me was that although they didn't have a business school, that I could somehow craft a Wharton type of education by taking courses at the Industrial and Labor Relations School, at the School of Agriculture, at the Hotel School, turned out to be baloney. Couldn't do it. Uh, so I came to work to get the real thing. And uh, I know you also taught finance classes for yeah. a little while at Wharton. Did you ever think uh, about becoming a professor? No. Uh, my one semester of teaching in the uh, Community Wharton Education Program disabused me of any notion that I could be a teacher. Uh, I taught intro finance to a wonderful um, group of uh, older students, most of whom were business people in Philadelphia. Um, and um, that was very rewarding, but I, I will say it was also a little scary, because if you're going to teach a course, you had better know it inside and out. And so I prepared like I've never had to prepare in my life. Um, and I, I, I was lucky I never had to rely on that old fallback of professors when they don't know the answer, which is to say, OK, who knows? But uh, it, was, it was a great experience. And immediately upon earning your MBA, you then enrolled in Harvard Law School? Yeah. So when did you decide that you didn't want to go work for your father? And I never decided that. that. Uh, at least I did, hadn't decided it at the time. And in all candor, I think what happened was uh, during my first uh, year at uh, Wharton uh, Graduate School, which took the place of my last year as a Wharton undergrad, uh, I was seeing that my friends were mostly going to law school or medical school. Um, and I thought, well, gee, after next year, I'm going to be finished, and I'm, I'm out in the real world, and I'm not really ready for that. So you know, my folks probably will pay for it. Um, so what the heck? I'll, I'll just keep going. I'll get a law degree. Couldn't hurt. Uh, so I applied to law school. Um, at the time that I was applying, I was actually in London, uh, having been selected um, to be one of the three uh, Wharton students representing the school uh, through an exchange program with the London Graduate School of Business. So I got to spend a semester in London, uh, also an extraordinary experience, and where I was very proud to represent uh, the university and Wharton in particular in London. Did and you so I was applying from there. Did you find a lot of similarities between the school in London and the school? They were pretty different. Uh, they were much more a case study oriented, more the Harvard Business School approach. Um, and I don't know what Wharton does today, but 25 years ago, we were not as much into case studies uh, as uh, London or Harvard were, um, particularly on the finance side we were. Uh, the, the, the biggest challenge, frankly, was um, just after when I discovered how different the British accounting system was. Uh, and so the first three weeks I spent just trying to ascertain the differences so that I could understand what they were doing in, their, in the finance classes I had to take there. And I finally mastered British accounting. The downside of that was when I came back to America, I no longer remembered as much as I should about US accounting. And though I am but one course away from eligibility to take the CPA exam, there is no chance anymore that I, I, I could score a point on that exam. So you went to Harvard um, yeah. Law School, and you had Alan Dershowitz as a professor. Sure did. You earned an A-plus in his class. I earned an A-plus from Alan Dershowitz in uh, <clears throat> professional responsibility. And uh, 
I hope Alan wouldn't be offended if I, if I said that uh, one doesn't know really what that means. But um, he's, a, he's a great professor and he's a great individual and a great human rights activist. And uh, he's always been extremely kind to me. So while he was probably the most famous of your professors, was, was he your most memorable professor? Uh, I would say either Alan or uh, Richard Parker, who taught us constitutional law. Um, I mean, I had other famous, I had Archibald Cox of Watergate fame teaching labor law. The problem with that is labor law was, to me, very boring. But I remember uh, Richard Parker, he was a young uh, assistant professor, didn't have tenure at the time. And uh, I didn't know much about constitutional law, and I really hadn't liked law school at all until that course. And uh, I was in awe of, of that document um, after a few weeks of con law, and I remain in awe of of, of that wonderful document and what it has enabled this country to do and the way in which it's um, protected our rights and allowed our rights to develop and flourish uh, and has, hard, you know, has not changed really all that much in these hundreds of years. So um, that was my most memorable course. And did you take constitutional law your first year? Um, gosh. No, it would have either been in the second semester. I think it was the second semester of the first year. And the other really memorable course was um, uh, copyright, which I had, I believe, in my third year with Arthur Miller, from whom I had had uh, a civil procedure. Civil procedure was not a great experience, but uh, copyright was, uh, in part because we used to be shown uh, alleged copyright violations um, and we would have to decide whether this really was an infringement. And I think I am the only person who was in that class who still does not believe that George Harrison's song, My Sweet Lord, is a ripoff, to use the popular expression, of uh, He's So Fine by, is it the Chiffons? Yeah. I don't remember. You can play those songs for me as many times as you like, and I don't believe it. Sorry, Professor. You said that you read in a Philadelphia magazine, mm -hmm. or in a Philadelphia newspaper, mm -hmm. a story about how INS was creating a special unit to investigate and prosecute Nazis, which of course was OSI, and that you knew in instantly that you wanted to work there that summer. Right. How did you know that? Well, let me back up and say that in the fall of my second year of law school, I came down to Philly uh, with a friend for a, a wedding of friends of the friend. and. Um, on the way back, uh, she was driving, and we stopped because I wanted to get a soda or something, or some pretzels, I suppose, for the trip. And I go into a little convenience store, and I thought, well, I'll get a newspaper, too. And I see all these newspapers, and I see one called the Jewish Exponent, which is the Jewish newspaper of Philadelphia. And among Jewish newspapers, quite prominent. But I had never heard of it in four years, four, four years of going to school in Philadelphia. I'd never even heard of it, much less seen it. So I thought, well, what the heck, might be interesting, I'll buy it. And as I'm reading it in the car, I see a little blurb, maybe an inch high, that INS is setting up a unit to deal with the Nazi cases. And about a year earlier, I guess, I had read a book uh, by Howard Blum of the New York Times called Wanted, The Search for Nazi Criminals in America, which I had found absolutely shocking. I had no idea that other than the one famous case of Hermina Brownstein and Ryan from the 1960s, that other Nazis were here. And as Blum presented it, there was um, a cover-up by the United States government. And uh, at, at best, the US government was doing nothing. At worst, it was intentionally allowing these people to live here in freedom. And I remember having gotten quite upset about the book, about the revelations as I understood them to be in the book. I must say, some of Blum's claims turn out, now that I've had access to the facts, to be not entirely correct. But the people he identified as Nazis really were some very bad people. And I'd actually toyed around with the idea of applying to INS for a summer position. Uh, you know, forgive me, uh, students can be a little naive. Here I would have been, you know, a student intern hoping to find out what was really going on. I mean, you know, I would have been more like Inspector Clouseau, I, I suspect. In any event, uh, they, they, were, they had established this unit. The moment I saw that, I thought, that's it. That's the job for me. I've got to get an internship there. Uh, we reached uh, uh, Cambridge uh, around midnight. I, certainly, I got back to my room around midnight. 
uh, to my apartment. Uh, and I uh, uh, figured, well, the Justice Department must have 24-hour operators. I'll call. I'll get the phone number of the unit. So first thing in the morning, I can call. And around midnight, I got the number of the unit and uh, spoke with the director. Uh, at that time, Martin Mendelssohn. And uh, he said, uh, where do you go to school? And I said, Harvard Law School. And he said, um, OK. He said, uh, do you know Alan Dershowitz? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know that there's any student here who can say that he or she really knows Alan Dershowitz. The man is incredibly busy. I don't think he has time to really get to know students. But he, he might remember me. And I, I realized I've mis misspoken. This must have been my second year of law school already. Uh, uh, maybe that is what I said. In any event, um, I said, he might remember me uh, because he gave me the only A-plus I've ever gotten in, in my entire life, starting with nursery school, uh, in professional responsibility. And B, I'm active in the Jewish Law Students Association, and he is our faculty advisor. Uh, so I believe that uh, Mr. Mendelssohn then called uh, Professor Dershowitz, and Alan recommended me, and uh, I had the job. And do you know if Mr. Mendelssohn was um, anticipating hiring a summer associate for that summer? I don't know. I don't know, but I was the first summer intern uh, who ever worked there. Um, do you remember your first day of work that summer? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it was almost unreal to me. I mean, here I was, uh, all of, how old could I have been? 20, well, let's figure it out, 79, 55, 24 years old. Uh, to my mind, quite late in history, uh, and I'm in the middle of a Nazi hunting operation. And there are classified documents all around me, which I'm not allowed to see because I don't have a security clearance. Uh, and uh, here are these amazing people who really care about these cases and are racing the clock to try to find the evidence and, and bring these cases. And I, I almost felt like I had to pinch myself, that I really had this job. Um, very few of us, I think, in life get to have the job that they want more than any other job. And since I couldn't uh, play for the Yankees, didn't have that talent, this was you know, the second choice, and maybe even would have been the first choice. And there I was. Uh, had an amazing summer uh, assisting in legal research, learning a lot, working with real lawyers. Uh, and um, I had worked with lawyers before. I had done a summer internship the previous summer at Skadden Arps one of the biggest, uh, most powerful firms in the country, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions work. Their, their famous specialty in Manhattan didn't care for that. Uh, it bored me. And now I was doing exciting work. And uh, I remember um, that I had tears in my eyes at the end of the summer when I was driving home. Did they offer you a position leaving. at the end of the summer? Uh, Marty made it clear that, uh, since he knew that I wanted to come back. I must have made that clear that um, he, he would like me to come back and would try to help me do that. But the route into the Justice Department, then as now, uh, if you're coming right out of law school, is only through the uh, Justice Department Honors Program, uh, which is very difficult to get into. In the criminal division, they were taking, I think, 10 students, um, graduates for the entire division. And they sought um, diversity. Uh, racial diversity, gender diversity, and geographic diversity. So basically, there was, you know, a slot for a white male, maybe, from the Northeast. And I'd have to get that. Um, and I did, thank goodness. But, you know, Marty and others fought hard for me, because I don't know that I would have gotten it otherwise. So maybe we should back up um, for a minute and explain exactly what OSI does, because sure. you guys do not have criminal jurisdiction, right. which is unusual for uh, the criminal department yes. of the Department we, of Justice. We are an anomaly in the uh, criminal division. Uh, our office was set up in uh, 1979, 78, 79, really, uh, initially in the Immigration Service, transferred in 79, and renamed Office of Special Investigations in the criminal division. Uh, we were set up. Uh, largely as a result of um, scandal. Uh, Howard Blum's book and New York Times coverage of this issue led to congressional hearings in 76, 77. Um, the principal um, instigators of those hearings in the Congress were Congressman Joshua Eilberg of Philadelphia and uh, Congress, 
Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman of New York and Congressman uh, Hamilton Fish Jr. of New York. And the testimony that was elicited in those hearings was quite shocking. Uh, again, at best, the government had given up years earlier. At worst, they were covering up. And it was clear that there were uh, at least hundreds of these people who had come to the United States. A lot of pressure was brought to bear on the Carter administration to do something. Uh, and they finally set up this unit in INS to undertake the first ever comprehensive law enforcement inquiry into these cases. Uh, as you say, uh, we lack criminal jurisdiction because the crimes took place outside the United States. Uh, there are now laws on the books that give the United States extraterritorial jurisdiction, for instance, in aviation piracy cases, uh, in uh, torture cases. But of course, to be uh, to avoid uh, being violative of the Constitution's ex post facto provisions, those statutes can only be prospective. You must commit the crime after the statute was enacted. enacted so we cannot have a statute that retrospectively confers jurisdiction on World War II offenses. Uh, when we were set up, our supporters, and they were mostly in the Jewish community, though certainly not exclusively, said to us that they were pleased that at long last the government apparently was getting serious about these cases, decades after it should have been. Uh, and they were pleased that at long last individuals who lived in this country who were complicit in these crimes would have something to worry about. I mean, these people surely, I know from experience, had uh, concluded decades earlier that they'd gotten away with it. Nobody was looking for them. They were home free in the land of the free. Ironically, living in a country that is home to uh, so many Holocaust survivors, perhaps more than any country other than, uh, than Israel. And, um, but our, our supporters said that they were realists and they understood that the uh, obstacles in our way would be daunting. After all, it's hard enough to prove a crime that took place yesterday. These crimes took place decades earlier and they took place thousands of miles away. Moreover, the crimes were committed in a manner intended uh, to physically eliminate those people who, had they survived, might have been inclined to cooperate with a government investigation. And usually, uh, the Nazis succeeded in that effort, and they did uh, murder all the witnesses. I'm suddenly reminded of a New Yorker profile of a prominent uh, uh, defense, criminal defense lawyer in New York uh, a few weeks ago who said that uh, his preferred kind of, he loves uh, uh, murder cases, he said, because the witness is dead, uh, easy to defend. Uh, but those cases, of course, are the prosecution. Um, so the, 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 the victim population was, was minimal. Moreover, in most cases, the witnesses don't know the names of the perpetrators. There was a mobile killing unit that came through town. Uh, all you could do was, if you were lucky, was hide. Maybe you'd see them at a great distance. Even in the concentration camps, they didn't usually know the names of the guards. They didn't wear little name tags. Uh, the, the prisoners usually knew them by nicknames based on their physical appearance or their particular kind of conduct, particularly if it was uh, excessive cruelty. Uh, well, we were told, you know, you'd have documents. The Germans and their acolytes were uh, famous for reducing things to writing. And, of course, the Nuremberg trials and, and the subsequent trials were, were based largely on captured documents. Well, unfortunately, in the closing months of the war, when, when the Nazis realized that all was lost, they uh, had huge bonfires and they burned perhaps the bulk of the incriminating documentation. The best, so to speak, of what survived was behind the Iron Curtain. It was captured by the Red Army. Uh, and it was in the archives of the then Warsaw Pact nations. The Soviets would not allow any Westerners into their archives. And until the day this, the, the communist regime died, so to speak, in Russia in the early 1990s, in the Soviet Union, they never did allow us or anybody else from the West into their archives. And it wasn't at all clear that they would cooperate with us in any fashion. Yet most of the crimes of the Holocaust took place on territory that was now behind the Iron Curtain. And you have to pursue the evidentiary trail to the scene of the crime where you've got hardly any chance of prevailing. Uh, moreover, the documents that did survive and were in accessible archives, that is, in accessible archives, uh, were largely in disarray. That's still the truth, or that's still true. They, they are poorly indexed, if at all. It's very much 
uh, a needle in a haystack search. It's the ultimate needle in a haystack search. But we were given historians, or permission to hire historians, uh, and we did hire, hire them, and they are the backbone of our effort. We're the only prosecutorial unit in the entire United States, probably in U.S. history, that has its own complement of historians, people who can find the proverbial needle in a haystack. And we've been uh, working at doing that now for some 21 years. And since I'm also the uh, chief cheerleader of our office, uh, I say with uh, great pride on behalf of my colleagues that we are by far the most successful government uh, uh, Nazi investigation and prosecution unit in the world. We've won more cases um, of this sort than all the other governments of the world put together and doubled or tripled in the last 10 years. Um, we're really good at what we do. Our record over the last uh, 11 years from 1990 to date is uh, 56 wins against two losses, and I will defend those two losses. Uh, we didn't lose them on the facts. We lost them on points of law, and I think the judges were wrong. Um, that's what we do, and I, I would uh, add that one can uh, go to the media and see uh, ABC News and the Washington Post and others calling us the most successful uh, government Nazi hunting unit on Earth, and I'm very proud of what my colleagues have accomplished. So you, you obviously work with historians, mm -hmm. and you work with INS because they right. help with the denaturalization and deportation process. Uh, with the deportation cases. Deportation. We work with the U.S. Attorney's offices on the denaturalization cases, but frankly, uh, with rare exceptions, um, they, the other components of the Justice Department step aside and let us do it because they know that we have the expertise. The, the, these cases are, deal with arcane historical subjects and arcane areas of law. Until recently, I could have said that all of the denaturalization cases, or virtually all of the denaturalization cases over the last 20 years citizenship revocation cases were all prosecuted by my office. Nobody else was, was doing those. Um, they're very hard to, to win. Uh, the, 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 the seminal cases are organized crime cases involving mobsters from Sicily, uh, all of whom were able to hire the best lawyers, and they won important decisions that make it difficult to prevail in these cases. They had good lawyers. Um, but. Uh, on, on occasion, there'll be a U.S. Attorney's Office that wants to uh, help us, and then they become our partners. But for the most part, we, we do it alone, and we do our own appellate work. Uh, everything except Supreme Court advocacy, which is the sole province of the Solicitor General's Office, we are extremely unusual by U.S. law enforcement standards in that we do our own investigative work and our own prosecutorial work. Uh, you mentioned you had done an internship in the uh, Philadelphia DA's office. So you know that they rely on the Philadelphia police and other um, uh, so-called you know, gun-carrying uh, law enforcement uh, agencies to do the bulk of the investigative work. Um, it's a bank robbery, police and the FBI handle it. Uh, we don't do that. The other agencies don't know how to investigate these cases. That's why the government lost nearly all of the relative handful of cases that it brought from 19, the early 50s until we were set up in 1979. You can't dabble in these cases. You've got to have specialized uh, human and material resources. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, um, it's, it's really hard to do your investigations because you don't have the kind of evidence that normal prosecutors are right. used to. You have no weapons. You have no fingerprints. Right. And you don't DNA. even have a lot of the victims. Right. So how does the investigation process start? And maybe you could walk us through mm -hmm. you know, how, how it finishes. Uh, exactly. We don't have the kind of evidence that prosecutors the world over are accustomed to having. No murder weapon, no fingerprint. Uh, um, and our, our case is really, um, in a sense, the, the obverse of a traditional law enforcement investigation. The classic, um, the classic murder case, for instance, is you've got a body uh, at the corner of uh, Chestnut and Sansom. Do they intersect? I think so. Here at the law school. There's a body there. And the, uh, the, the, the question, as Agatha Christie would uh, pose it classically, is who done it? Uh, our cases are, are very different. We normally work not from the crime to the perpetrator, but rather from the suspect to the crime. We will identify someone, and I'll explain how we do that, who was um, likely involved in Nazi crimes of persecution. That's our legal standard under Title VIII for deportation, and it's our legal standard also, in general, for denaturalization. We have to prove involvement in 
Nazi or, for that matter, uh, Axis, Japanese, even uh, sponsored acts of persecution. And we have had some Japanese cases, which I, I hope there'll be a moment to address. Uh, so, for instance, we'll have someone who's a concentration camp guard or who was a member of a unit that was primarily a mobile killing unit, or who was a collaboration, co collaborationist police official in, say, Lithuania, or, as in the Otto von Bolschwing case, was a senior advisor to Adolf Eichmann, the so-called you know, architect of the so-called final solution to the so-called Jewish question. Uh, but what did they do? What did they do? They had years and years and years of service uh, during the war, and at any particular moment, they might have stepped over the line and committed a crime of persecution or participated in such a crime, but you've got to figure out how and when. And that's as challenging an undertaking as I think exists in American law or world law enforcement. Uh, but we have uh, great experience now in doing that. And so I'll give an example. Uh, we have tasked our historians since almost the beginning with responsibility for gathering names of suspects. And they do this as they uh, conduct their research in archives uh, all over the world, including in the United States. And they've succeeded in gathering more than 60,000 names of uh, suspected European and Japanese perpetrators. Uh, the entire senior core of the SS is actually the largest block of names. That's over 40,000 names right there. And we have um, uh, done something uh, unique with those names. There, there is this Hollywood conception of our work best exemplified by the, the closing scene of the movie Marathon Man, where the Nazi doctor character played by Sir Lawrence Olivier makes the mistake of going to the Diamond District of Manhattan, where many survivors were working 20 years ago. And he's recognized by a woman, an elderly woman survivor, who screams out his name and gives chase. And she's joined by other survivors. Very dramatic. It's great cinema, but it's not reality. Uh, we do get these calls from the public. We call them, my neighbor is a Nazi. It's usually, um, he's uh, European and he's the right age. And he's very unpleasant and he wears a leather coat and he has a German Shepherd. Those never pan out. Uh, what we do instead is take these names that our historians have gotten and check them methodically one by one against US immigration records, uh, trying as best we can to allow for different spellings of names, for instance, Cyrillic names, like Russian names, Belarusian names. Ukrainian names can be transliterated any number of different ways. Uh, we have to allow for that. And we check them one by one against US immigration records. And that's how we find our suspect. Example, uh, in the 80s, we got a list of guards at the Mauthausen concentration camp uh, in uh, German annexed Austria near Linz. And we got birth dates on these men. That's often very difficult, but we got birth dates. And we sent the names to the immigration service. And the number came back as hits, as we call them, uh, one of them being a fellow named Stefan Liley. Then we check to find out if Liley is still alive. That knocks out, at this point, over 50% of our preliminary inquiries. But he was alive, living in uh, northern New Jersey in a New York City suburb. And we put two people on the case, uh, Peter Black, who was Dr. Peter Black, our chief historian. Almost all of our historians have PhDs. All speak German, and they have other languages among them. Uh, with one exception, all, by the way, born in the United States. Uh, and also a very talented lawyer named Mike Bernstein, who would later become my deputy. Uh, Peter decided to begin his research at the National Archives down the street from us because the United States Army had liberated Mauthausen. So the documents that were captured would likely repose in the National Archives. Sure enough, there were many documents there. And early in his research, Peter encountered a series of volumes big books, accountant's logs, really, uh, with um, pre-printed lines uh, going uh, horizontally and vertically, and handwritten entries going all the way from the left-hand margin of the left page to the right-hand margin of the right page. And uh, the, what each of these few surviving volumes wa uh, was, was a chronological listing of, uh, of prisoners who, who died. But they were prisoners who died in a particular way. Uh, the SS denominated each volume Registry of Unnatural Deaths at the Mauthausen concentration camp. And in SS parlance, an unnatural death was an execution because a natural death, alas, at Mauthausen 
what was death due to uh, the usual uh, reasons, uh, uh, starvation, exposure, disease, general mistreatment. Uh, these people were executed. And as you go down the columns, you see a uh, last you know, name, uh, reason held, which was usually French Jew, Dutch Jew, Jew of one nationality or another, but also American prisoners of war who were murdered en masse. They are British prisoners of war. Um, location, uh, date of death, location within the camp system of the execution, the means of execution employed, and it will say Erschissen for, or Schissen for uh, shooting uh, or Erhangen for hanging. I think it's Erschissen for shooting. Uh, and then most importantly, the name of the SS man who carried it out. Obviously, the Germans never imagined that they could lose the war and that these documents would fall into Allied hands. Uh, our forces uh, paid for these documents in blood, and we treat them with great reverence, um, knowing that uh, 200,000 American families sacrificed their precious sons to win that war. Just that's the, the war against uh, the war in Europe alone. And uh, uh, we knew from this document, I remember it well, that a uh, French Jew named Leon Axelrud, who was very young, around 20, uh, held because he was a French Jew, died there on the ninth day of December 1943, uh, having been shot to death at the main camp by SS Schutze, SS Private Stefan Liley. Well, Mike uh, then sent Liley a letter asking him to uh, come to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark, New Jersey for an interview, voluntarily. You have a right not to come, right to bring an attorney if you do come. Liley shows up, no attorney. Uh, and Mike proceeds to question him, and it's on audio tape. Uh, and it's pretty much a standard OSI interrogation. Uh, SS? No, I was never in the SS. I was in the German Army. Uh, until Mike showed him an SS record, and then it was like, oh, well, I thought of it as the German Army, but it was sort of, you know, a combat unit of the SS. Okay. Concentration camp? No, not me. I didn't even hear about camps until after the war, uh, till Mike showed him a document that proved he was at Mount Hausman. Oh, that camp. Well, I was on the outside. I never went in, and I don't even know what happened there. No idea. Nobody told me. Could you see inside? No. Did you smell anything in the air? No. Didn't hear any screams? No. Never saw a prisoner? No. Until Mike showed him, ever shoot anybody? No. Until Mike showed him this document, um, the best evidence of murder I've ever seen because it's the routine, bureaucratic, administrative recordation of a homicide. It's better than a confession because some people, for whatever reason, uh, confess to things that they didn't, didn't do, either because of what we can call overreaching by the authorities, uh, even torture, um, or because they have a mental problem, or they're trying to cover for somebody else. Uh, and then shown that, Lila said, oh, yes, there was that one time. And, uh, well, Mike said, uh, why did you shoot him? He said, uh, because uh, he was running. And then Mike asked what I still think is the best question I've ever heard a prosecutor ask. He said, well, he couldn't have escaped, could he? And Lyle said, oh, no, it was impossible to escape. So why'd you shoot him? Because he was running. Uh, we later ascertained that what almost certainly was going on uh, here was um, the SS uh, uh, forces, Lyle among them, were engaged in a fairly common practice at Mount House, in which is they would take a prisoner, ask the prisoner, order the prisoner to, to toss his cap across the line near the fence beyond which prisoners were not allowed to go, uh, or they would do it for him, and then they would order the prisoner to retrieve his cap. If he retrieved his cap, went over the line, it was human target practice time. Uh, and if he refused, uh, they would say, you disobeyed an order, we're going to shoot you. The prisoner would normally run, and they would, again, get their human target practice. And that's how young Leon Axelrude uh, left this earth. Uh, we then brought a uh, denaturalization case in federal district court in Newark. Uh, as soon as we found that Liley fled to Germany, and uh, we won a uh, default judgment, and Germany was an acceptable destination as far as we were concerned because they have criminal jurisdiction. Uh, they investigated, did not prosecute. Unfortunately, that is uh, common in, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, Europe has long ago uh, abdicated, abdicated, abdicated its uh, moral and legal uh, responsibility in these cases. They hardly ever prosecute. Liley changed his story when he got there. Uh, now he said he shot him in the, shot the prisoner in the leg. With us, he said he shot him in the, in the shoulder. 
Uh, in any event, uh, uh, he died uh, fairly recently without ever having been prosecuted. Um, if I may tell the end of this story, a couple of years later, uh, the Austrian government, in a fit of pique, I suppose, over um, the United States government's decision to bar the entry of their president, Kurt Waldheim, the former UN, UN Secretary General, uh, based on an, uh, an investigation that I had initially done uh, during the period between my two stints at Justice when I was General Counsel of uh, the World Jewish Congress in New York. Um, and we had exposed his uh, involvement in Nazi crimes in the German army in the Balkans. Uh, the Austrian government uh, of Kurt Waldheim, of President Waldheim, not being amused, shall we say, by this, um, suddenly told us that they would no longer take back into Austrian territory Nazis who had immigrated to the United States from their country. And we showed them a, uh, an agreement between our governments from 1954 in which Austria said they would take back people who immigrated through fraudulent means to the United States from Austria. And uh, they nonetheless said that uh, they would not take them, that they did not consider that agreement uh, still to be binding, even though it said uh, by its terms that they would take these people back at any time. And uh, we virtually wanted to shout out, you know, what is there about at any time that you don't understand? But they agreed to discuss the issue, and my boss and I were considered uh, by us uh, too controversial as interlocutors because of our roles in the Waldheim case. So the task fell to my deputy, Mike Bernstein. They had a round of um, discussions in Washington, which did not succeed in changing the Austrian position. The Austrians said the next round has to be in Vienna. And in December 1988, Mike flew to Vienna, somehow persuaded the Austrians to relent. And they agreed to take these people back. Um, with the fruits of uh, victory in his briefcase, Mike returned uh, homeward. And he flew from Vienna uh, to London Heathrow, where he realized he could get uh, home to his family uh, an hour earlier uh, if um, he changed flights. And so he changed from a Lufthansa flight uh, to Pan American World Airways Flight 103, uh, which uh, two hours later, I think, or an hour later, um, was exploded in midair by a terrorist bomb over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing Mike uh, and 269 other people in the air and on the ground, uh, which was by far the worst experience um, I've ever had uh, in, in, in the workplace. Seeing uh, and spending time with uh, Mike's wife Stephanie uh, and his children, Sarah, who was seven, and Joey, three and a half, uh, and it was Hanukkah for their for that family, expecting Daddy to be home, and he wasn't. Uh, but if you told me then that in uh, January, February of the year 2001, where we are, where we have just uh, passed, um, that one of the monsters who planted that bomb would actually have been found, would be tried and convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. I would have thought that highly unlikely, but that is what has happened. And um, So I rather think that the Pan Am 103 cases, like the Nazi cases that we do, uh, a small measure of justice has been secured so far. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had left the Department of Justice for a few years. Um, mm -hmm. You joined a big New York law firm. Mm -hmm. Then you went to work at the World Jewish Congress, mm -hmm. where you did investigate and expose former UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim um, as having a Nazi past. There was obviously a lot of controversy over this exposure. Mm -hmm. um, was this investigation, do you think, the most publicized of any that you've done? I would say that or the, um, the Arthur Rudolph case would be the, the, the highest profile cases that, that I personally worked on. Uh, I must say I, I miscalculated several times in the Waldheim case. The first was when I was told that there are some suspicions about Kurt Waldheim. Eli, go to Vienna because you've done these investigations for the Justice Department. You all know what to do. And my response was, get serious. I mean, the man was 10 years in the media capital of the world, Manhattan. It was well known that he had served in the German army. People always used to whisper, that Nazi Waldheim. Surely um, no one who had a compromised past um, who was involved in Nazi war crimes would have dared to subject himself in that way to the scrutiny of the New York media. Uh, so I didn't believe it, uh, but I was wrong. Uh, and he was involved in those crimes uh, 
during his service in the uh, high command of Army Group E in, in the Balkans, uh, particularly in, in Bosnia. Uh, the poor people of Bosnia have suffered through crimes against humanity twice in this uh, past century, once during World War II and once uh, fairly recently uh, during the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, the other time I miscalculated was I had assumed that when we exposed him, which was while he was running for uh, the presidency of Austria, um, you know how these things come out during campaigns, uh, I had assumed that he would immediately resign. We gave the story to the New York Times, which of course ran it on the front page back in March of 86, and suddenly it was you know, the, the biggest Nazi expose of all times and one of the greatest political scandals of all times. Uh, in the United States, and of course we came to this from an American perspective where candidates have had to drop out of president, presidential elections because of marital infidelity, because of uh, marijuana, I think, uh, because of all kinds of, by comparison, modest offenses. Uh, you know, almost little bitty lies are enough at the presidential level to get you disqualified. And this was a big lie. I mean, he had completely distorted his wartime history. While he claimed he was a law student, which you and I will recall as the basically the lowest form of life, uh, he was, in fact, at that even lower form of life, he was you know, fighting for the Nazis uh, in the Balkans. Sorry. And, um, but he didn't resign. And instead, he got stronger as a candidate. And the party that was sponsoring his candidacy, the Austrian People's Party, uh, responded by launching the first overtly anti-Semitic campaign to be run at the national level by a major European political party since the Nazi Party of Europe had done it, of Germany had done it in the 1930s. And to our astonishment and, and horror, it, it seems to have succeeded and he was elected and served his full six-year term uh, as the pariah president of Austria who uh, was unable to secure an invitation to uh, any uh, foreign countries except Germany, Liechtenstein, uh, Pakistan, and some of the countries in the Arab world. You actually exposed, as you said, um, Waldheim while he was running for office, but you actually claim that famed Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal mm. um, had known about Waldheim's record but failed to make it public. I uh, ended up writing a book on the Waldheim case called The Betrayal, which was uh, supposed to be the story of the investigation and the cover-up, and it was. Uh, in the course of writing the book, which took a very long time, six years or so, uh, I found that I was finally able to answer the, the biggest mystery of the case, which was no longer what did he do during the war, that was amply documented, but rather how is it that it never came out? Uh, and it was painful for me, who had lionized uh, Simon Wiesenthal, the famed Vienna Nazi hunter, and I'd lionized him as a youngster, uh, to tell the truth, which was that uh, during Waldheim's UN tenure, when he had been overtly hostile to Israel on a number of occasions, uh, turned out the Israelis suddenly thought, you know, we ought to look into his past. Let's see what's going on here. And to whom did they turn? Simon Wiesenthal, makes sense. And Wiesenthal used his resources to get uh, some of Waldheim's war records. And had Wiesenthal studied those records carefully, he would have found that uh, they showed that Waldheim was in a very bad unit during World War II, and that he was lying about it, that he was there when he was supposed to have been in law school. Uh, Wiesenthal didn't do his homework, as unfortunately was often the case. and. Um, also was, uh, has a bias in favor of Waldheim's party for a variety of reasons, and told the Israelis that Waldheim was, uh, was clean, so to speak. And so the one attempt by a government that had an incentive to expose Waldheim failed because they relied on the wrong person. Uh, exposing what Mr. Wiesenthal did, uh, and I should add that during the many months in which Waldheim was being exposed, his biggest defender was Simon Wiesenthal. It was very awkward for us uh, to have Waldheim constantly saying, Wiesenthal says, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, later, I realized that the reason Wiesenthal was saying that was because he had already cleared Waldheim for the Israelis and was hoping that uh, 
it would not develop that Waldheim was a war criminal because that would prove he was wrong. Uh, it was already clear he had not done a competent job of vetting Waldheim. Uh, that was, again, a very controversial part of my book. Uh, and It was very painful to have people attack me for telling the truth. And since I felt that people would not believe that Wiesenthal uh, had been incompetent um, in this case, uh, because they would say, well, he's so, he did such a wonderful job in all these other cases, why would he suddenly get stupid, so to speak? Um, I decided I really needed to tell the whole truth, which I did in the book. And it's sort of the sub-theme of the book, that in case after case after case, uh, Mr. Wiesenthal, who deserves a tremendous amount of credit for keeping the, the issue of unprosecu unprosecuted Nazis alive. Without Wiesenthal, my office wouldn't exist. No one would be looking for Nazis anymore, I must admit that. Um, but his claims to prowess in Nazi hunting are mostly baloney. Uh, a man who has taken uh, credit for finding Eichmann didn't find Eichmann. He didn't tell the Israelis where Eichmann was in 1959, 1960. He told the Israelis that Eichmann was in Germany. Eichmann was in Argentina. That's where the Israelis found him. Okay. He's taken credit for a lot of things. He's been wrong in all the major cases, all the major cases. So uh, I had to tell that story, too. And I took some heat. On the other hand, I uh, won some nice accolades for the book. And that uh, was a great relief to me. But of course, um, Waldheim was not the only cover-up. You know, you worked with yeah. um, Arthur Rudolph, mm -hmm. who uh, worked for NASA in the United States. Our, our government actually brought these people here and protected them. H how did those cases affect you, you know, knowing that it was your own government who was giving safe harbor to these people? You know, there, there are times when, uh, in my work, when one doesn't feel as proud as one, like, one would like to feel uh, as a U.S. official. Um, our government has, on occasion, done things uh, that I've encountered that uh, one would have preferred that they not have done. Uh, one was bringing Otto uh, von Bolschwing to the United States. He was brought here by U.S. intelligence, uh, a man who had uh, worked for Eichmann uh, and who, although U.S. intelligence uh, really didn't know, we found it later, had actually proposed to Eichmann uh, uh, the pogrom that we now know as Kristallnacht in Germany. Um, Rudolf was another case. Uh, he had been a Nazi slave master supervising concentration camp inmates under grotesquely inhumane conditions, building V-2 missiles in an underground uh, missile factory that was uh, part of uh, the Dora Nordhausen concentration camp in central, central Germany. At the end of the war, uh, he and Werner von Braun and the rest of the major figures in the German missile program were brought to the United States under a then secret program called Project Paperclip. They were put to work on the uh, uh, U.S. defense program building missiles for us. Rudolph became ultimately uh, uh, the head of the uh, Pershing missile program. Uh, and then in the early 60s, after President Kennedy announced that we would attempt a lunar landing within the decade, uh, he and most of the others switched over to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and Rudolph became project director of the Saturn V project, program director of the Saturn V program. And so it is a sad part of our history that the, the man who uh, built the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969 uh, was a Nazi slave master. And uh, I questioned him. He made a lot of damning admissions. We found extraordinary documentation on his case. Um, and he uh, agreed to leave the country and give up his citizenship, go back to Germany rather than contest charges here, and as is so often the case, the Germans investigated but did not prosecute. Um, in the early 1990s, the Iron Curtain fell, mm -hmm. and millions of documents that had been sealed off from Western eyes were made available to you and your colleagues. When you heard that the curtain had fallen, did you know that you would get access to these documents? Well, we hoped that we would. Um, what we did not know is what a treasure trove of evidentiary riches we would find there. Uh, we got some of our people uh, uh, in to the archives uh, just as the Iron Curtain was falling. Uh, I, I, I have in mind uh, Mike McQueen, one of our top historians, who got into Soviet archives in Lithuania when there were two governments there, the, the self-proclaimed uh, independent government of Lithuania and the Soviet Republic government. 
And uh, if you had a Soviet visa to get into Lithuania, and you couldn't get in without a Soviet visa because you had to go through Moscow, um, the Lithuanians wouldn't talk to you. But somehow Mike got everybody to talk to him and um, found these amazing documents. And we had thought that we were nearing the end of our program by that point. We had mined most of the troves of evidence we were aware of. Uh, suddenly we found this new treasure trove and found that cases that had languished uh, as investigations in which we'd reached dead ends suddenly were prosecutable cases. The evidence could be found. Uh, we also found evidence on many, many people who had died while they were under investigation and were they still alive we would have been able to prosecute. We also found leads on lots of new cases and suddenly we were incredibly busy again. And even now in the year 2001, we are terrifically busy. We have 17 cases in court around the country, over 200 people under investigation. We have as many cases in court as the Hague Tribunal has, the Hague Tribunal that's been set up to by the UN to handle cases involving the former Yugoslavia, crimes in Bosnia and Croatia and elsewhere. Uh, one difference is our budget's about $4 million and their budget's, I think, over $200 million. Uh, but of course, they do very fine work and I think uh, so do we. Uh, if you had told me in 1979 when I was a summer intern or 1980 or 1985 that we would still be in business in 2001, still be busy, still be so busy that I hardly ever get to have lunch, except, you know, a sandwich at my desk, that I would still, in the year 2001, feel that the worst thing that can happen to me on the phone is for someone to say, hey, let's do lunch, because it takes me away from the work, I would have said, impossible. But we're swamped. We're swamped with our regular cases. We've got 33 people doing this work. I think it's 13 lawyers, 10 of the best historians in the world, and support staff. We're swamped with our regular cases. We're swamped with um, the work that we do in support of the U.S. government uh, effort at this late date to trace the fate of gold and artwork and uh, books and uh, other property that was looted by the Nazis. We're swamped with our work uh, pursuant to the Nazi War Crimes Disclo Disclosure Act of 1998 that requires the executive branch to locate every classified document in federal possession relating to Axis crimes uh, and to review them, to declassify them, and to disclose them. It's the largest search, declassify, and disclose operation in world history uh, for which uh, Congress allocated in the first uh, year or so the grand sum of zero dollars. Uh, and yet we've been doing it. We've disclosed hundreds of thousands of important documents. Uh, it's, it's really uh, beyond belief. And on top of it all, uh, the Senate has passed a bill that confers on my little office jurisdiction over post-World War II crimes against humanity. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. government has repeated the mistake that it made in the Nazi cases, waiting decades to get serious. Um, and so now um, we have a significant number of Cambodian war criminals, Somalian war criminals, Rwandan war criminals, Guatemalan criminals, you name it, they're here and uh, the government is still uh, behind the curve in taking action. Um, like you said, now you have jurisdiction to, to prosecute these other crimes. Mm -hmm. And just last well, week... Well, I mean, we actually don't have it yet. Uh, the Senate passed the bill. No, the the House version is, is languishing in the Do House. Do you think that it will pass? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I think some version of the law will pass. I, I think the issue is whether my office will end up being heavily involved in the cases. But someone... I hope is going to do this work because it needs to be done. Um, well, just last week, for the first time in history, the United Na Nations handed down a decision in a case where they prosecuted and condemned Bosnian Serb soldiers for sexual slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first time, rape was actually defined as a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this will help OSI at all in their prosecutions, for example, of Japanese soldiers who had used women, um, they termed them comfort women, during World War II? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a landmark development. Um, the, the first time that rape was ever prosecuted uh, in the World War II context actually was right after the war uh, by a Dutch court. Um, uh, and the victims there were so-called comfort women who were Dutch citizens in Indonesia, which Japan occupied. Uh, 
years ago, as, as you mentioned, we um, took up uh, these Japanese cases uh, and focused initially on the so-called comfort women cases. Um, the only uh, correction I'll make um, uh, is uh, they weren't uh, all women. A lot of them were children. They were young girls. Very young, some of them. And uh, they were kidnapped in places like Korea and occupied China, Indonesia, the Philippines, and taken to serve day after day, month after month, year after year, in camps where they were forced to provide sexual services to Japanese soldiers and, and officers. Uh, and as if that weren't bad enough, having to do that many times a day, they were to many of them were tortured, some of them were killed. Uh, when they got pregnant, uh, their babies would be taken away and even killed. These are some of the worst uh, crimes we've ever encountered. We actually interviewed uh, two of the surviving comfort women from Korea, and uh, we'd like to think of ourselves as uh, fairly hardened prosecutors, but uh, they had us all in tears, as do Holocaust survivors frequently do to us. Uh, and uh, in 1996, we um, identified some people who were involved in the so-called comfort women cases. And uh, although they weren't here, we uh, put them on this uh, so-called uh, border control watch list maintained by the INS and State Department and Customs Service. Same list that we put Kurt Waldheim on and more than 60,000 other people. And every month we get calls from INS at different airports that one or another Nazi or Japanese perpetrator who's been put on the watch list at our behest has now shown up. And we have them questioned and usually sent back. Uh, we issued an announcement in uh, 96 that individuals involved in the comfort women crimes uh, were being barred. And we had a little um, discussion with the State Department because our draft press release for the Justice Department used what I call the R word. We called it what it was. It was the crime of rape. And the State Department said, oh, you know, the Japanese are going to be very upset with this. And uh, they're very sensitive on World War II issues. Uh, we can't really deal with them the way we deal with the Germans. We really forced the Germans to confront their past. We did not do that with the Japanese. We have to tread lightly. Can't you just avoid that word? Which we have put in our press release about five times. Um, and frankly, our hope was in publicizing those cases that we would um, give a, a shot in the arm, so to speak, to those who were pressing to have rape in wartime treated as a crime against humanity and prosecuted like the other crimes against humanity. Uh, and I'd like to think that we did contribute to, to, to that development in The Hague in some very small way. Uh, and uh, so we discussed this with the State Department and I recall finally saying, look, if you want, we can send this issue of using our word up the chain of command at your agency and mine and ultimately it will get to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General. Uh, and I uh, am fairly confident that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and Attorney General Janet Reno will agree that we should call the crime rape. And that kind of ended the discussion. <laughs> um, you have two so we did use the word. You have two very young daughters. Yeah. Um, how much do you tell them about your work and the atrocities that you learn about? Uh, I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old, and um, I have not discussed, uh, discussed it with them. I did very much want to um, shield, shield them from this. I know my 12-year-old has for some years been interested. She read the diary of Anne Frank and some other uh, works that are um, not, uh, not uh, on the sort of gruesome side of Holocaust literature, but and more geared to children. I think my older daughter knows probably a lot because I have an extensive library at home and I'm sure being a normal child, she has uh, invaded that from time to time and read some things. I, I don't know if my nine-year-old really knows anything. In fact, her brownie troop just did a, uh, or is about to do a uh, field trip to the Holocaust Museum and I'm holding her back from that. She's not ready. If you could leave them with one lesson from your work at OSI, what would it be? One last. One lesson. One lesson. Uh, I think I know what that would be. Uh, it would be to stand up uh, to injustice. And I would give them two examples of two women. 
who did that. One was Elizabeth Holtzman, who almost single-handedly uh, forced the Carter administration to set up our office. She fought them every day. I don't know why the administration resisted. Probably because they knew these cases were so hard that the odds of prevailing were between slim and none. Uh, and I think sometimes that the White House finally set up the unit only when they were convinced that Liz was maybe a day away from setting herself a fire in front of the White House. Uh, so Liz would be one example. Uh, and the other would be Vlad Kamid. Uh, well, maybe two other examples. Vlad Kamid, uh, who uh, I've had the privilege of meeting, uh, who is a survivor uh, and a heroine of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto resistance. She was a courier and very bravely went in and out of the ghetto. She had sort of Aryan looks, uh, and that enabled her to pass as a non-Jew, risked her life every day. Uh, and the great privilege of my work has been to meet survivors and to meet rescuers. So the final example I will, would give is uh, Meep Gies, who is the principal heroine of the Anne Frank story, the only uh, personality, if you will, from the Anne Frank story who is still alive. God bless her. And I had the extraordinary experience just a few years ago of uh, arranging a meeting for her when she was visiting Washington with Attorney General Reno. And this amazing lady who risked her life for s over 700 days to protect the, the Franks and the others in the secret annex, bring them food. Uh, and it was very dangerous what she did. And it's amazing she didn't get caught. And then uh, when the raid came, she risked her life uh, trying to bribe local officials into releasing these people, and then risked her life again to uh, violate a police ban on going back into the annex. She went in, found the diary, rescued it, saved it for the world, and then on that terrible day, which as a father of daughters is hard to remember, uh, but I read it in Meep's book, uh, Mrs. Geese's book, a terrible day when they were sitting in Otto Frank's office in Holland, hoping against hope that the children were coming back. And the word came back that they had died. She reached into her desk, drawer, unlocked it, pulled out the diary, and brought it to Mr. Frank and said, Anne left this for you. So this woman who saved the diary, created the conditions under which she could be written, and actually I think even had purchased the blank diary for this little girl. Um, she's a good example for all of us. I, I think actually that the most important thing, lesson to come out of the Holocaust comes not from studying the perpetrators, because there will always be bad people everywhere who, given the opportunity, will do bad things. But what we have to learn is what motivates people to be heroes. Where did Meep Geese find the courage to do what she did? I've, I've met a number of those people, and they all look at me like I'm from another planet when I ask that question. I, I met a um, Catholic priest from Poland who was uh, part of a very large family. He was a teenager, and they saved a large number of Jews in their barn. Had they been caught, they all would have been killed. The father, the mother, all the children. That was the standard penalty. And yet they did it. And I, I asked him, you know, where did you, where did your dad, who was the principal force in this, where did he find the courage to do this? And, you know, he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, look, my father said that what the Germans are doing to these Jews is wrong. And so we must help them. And, uh, if they perish, then we will perish with them, just like that. And the whole family followed. And I, I remember thinking, ah, that doesn't tell me anything. I didn't learn anything. And then later I thought, no, I did learn something. I learned something very important. It must have been the case that his father had established himself through word and deed over the years within that family as a moral authority. They knew that he always did the right thing. And so when their father said, this is the right thing to do, they knew from experience that he always was correct about such things. And so they all followed. 
The problem is it doesn't tell me where he found the courage to do that. Because I think very few of us would have that courage. I mean, if you ask me, if God forbid, and I thought a lot about this, a crime, a genocidal crime was committed against some group in the United States that I was not a member of, I would certainly want to help them. And if I were single, maybe I would have the, the courage to do it. If you ask me, could I risk my life, I would like to think so, though when tested, of course, very few of us have that courage, so I don't know. Uh, I have the same fears that everybody else has. Would I risk, uh, would my wife risk her life with me? Maybe. She's a good person. But would we risk our children's lives? It's very hard to imagine. Very, very hard to imagine. And yet people did that. If we can figure out what motivates them and bottle that, we'll save the world. That's the key. Study those people. Well, OSI has been named, as you mentioned earlier, by ABC News, the most successful government Nazi hunting agent or organization on Earth. And what Washington Post said it's the world's most aggressive and effective Nazi hunting operation. And it has also been said that OSI boasts a tremendous success record, having uncovered and won more cases than any other Nazi hunting operation in the world. And you personally have been called the man the Nazis fear most. That's a tremendous legacy to leave. You should be very proud of yourself. Well, thank you. That's, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a great interview. And I, I, I say I, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come back to Penn, uh, where I had many of the happiest years of my life. I love this university. didn't go to this law school, but I went to this university, and I love it dearly. Uh, and it's a, a privilege to, to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, I, I as you can you tell, neat, I don't speak in sound bites. I don't know how to do a short answer. No, that's good. I am. Um, but I, I I've had like a hundred questions. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't get to them. No, 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 no. I didn't expect to get to half of them. I don't. Really I think we covered all the main points, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a lot of questions that I had about specific, you know, famous cases, oh. but I kind of wanted to get past that because you I know, read so could, much about people it. People could always look it. that up, you know. They could oh. go online, but they wouldn't <laughs> necessarily. Right, I mean, that stuff is there. The propaganda is there. I have. But I think so. the questions that, that you asked were more of the kind that you wouldn't find. Yeah, you know, that's what I was there. hoping for. Thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you. This was, this was thank great. Thank you, Gates. Thank you, Gates. I'm still wired here somewhere. Would it be possible to get a copy? Yes, definitely. I can get I can get a copy.